Amen. Thank you, Brother Billy. What a great song. Amen. Man, that just stirs your heart. Uh, this morning, we're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 20. 2 Kings chapter 20. While you're turning there, let me give you uh, a couple of announcements. First of all, because of all the holidays and, and a lot of our regulars are out of town and it's hard to staff a nursery and stuff, uh, there are no Sunday night services tonight or Wednesday night activities because of New Year's uh, Eve. Uh, next Sunday, we're back to regular schedule. So y'all enjoy a little bit of time off because next Sunday it's going to be, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say back to normal. I don't know what normal is around here, but we're back to regular schedule. Uh, we have one slot open if you're interested in going to Israel in March with us. We've got 90 people that are going to be invading the Holy Land from Flint Baptist Church. And um, if you'd be interested in going male or female, either one, but we do, do have one slot open. So if you're available uh, or would like to go, either contact me or Dr. Hammond. And uh, this afternoon, I'd ask you to be on the lookout for an email uh, regarding our new church software, because our church continues to grow, we're having to get new church software. It's called Realm, R-E-A-L-M, and uh, you may be getting an email this afternoon. Over the next two weeks, there will be somebody out in the foyer to help you with this stuff if you have questions about it. But if you are a member and you already signed up with ACS, be on the lookout for it, okay? Second uh, Kings chapter 20, if you would please stand in honor of God's word. Exciting. Uh, Ty and Gail Freeman had a new uh, grandchild this morning. Shelby gave birth to a little baby boy, so we're excited about that. And a healthy little boy. So 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 1. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to visit him and said to him, Thus saith the Lord, set thy house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall, and he prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, please remember how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. It came to pass, afore Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord, and I will add unto thy days fifteen years. I will deliver thee in this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, this morning we're here to just worship you. God, to give you of our very best time, of our treasures, and of our talent. God, I pray that the way that we treat one another and shake hands and, and greet each other would be the way that we would greet Jesus if we were sitting next to him. I pray, oh God, that not only will we worship you, but God, that we'll have open ears and open heart to learn from you. God, that you will teach us things today that may benefit us years down the road. Give us wisdom. Help us, God, to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, and we will give you all glory and praise, for it's in his wonderful name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. This morning's sermon is akin to a gourmet feast in that there's so many different layers to explore. You know, have you ever gotten one of those really good meals where every bite you took, you went, I'm tasting something different. That's, oh, man, that's good. And then you take another bite and you're going, man, that's good too. And it's just complex. It's almost like peeling away the layers of an onion because there's so many great truths that are, that are identified with this scripture. I think the same thing. So a lot of the application today, you're going to have to pray to the Holy Spirit and say, you know, God, you apply this to my life because there's so many scenarios that this actually applies to. So let's begin with the background. Y'all remember Hezekiah. He is a very, very good king. And he came to the throne about 716 B.C. The first 14 years of his reign are absolutely phenomenal. 
He comes in and on the first day of the first month of the first year and he begins to repair the doors on the house and the Bible says that there is a revival that takes place that I believe in the Old Testament is probably one of the greatest revivals that ever takes place bar none. They get rid of the idolatry. They get rid of, of the sacrificing of children to Molech. They open the doors of the house. They begin having sacrifices on the altar, burnt sacrifice. They reinstitute the Passover. And the Bible even goes so far as to say that for the first time since the kingdom is divided, they invite the northern cousins, the Israelites, down to participate. And it's one of the greatest Passovers of all time is celebrated under the reign of King Hezekiah. The Bible says that there's a great victory during the first 14 years of Hezekiah. The Assyrians under a king by the name of Sennacherib comes down and invades the land of Judah. He takes some of the border cities. He lays siege around the city of Jerusalem. And, and brother, it looks like bad, bad news for the city of Jerusalem until Hezekiah and Isaiah begin to pray. And the Bible says they go to the altar of the Lord. They lay down a letter from the king of, of Assyria. And they say, God, do you see what he's saying about you? God, we believe that you're powerful enough to deliver us. And the Bible says in one night, in one night, one angel of the Lord kills 185,000 Assyrian soldiers and takes them out like that. The city is delivered, great victory, great miracle took place. There's peace among the neighbors. Prior to Hezekiah getting on the throne during the reign of Ahaz, the Bible says that they were attacked by the Philistines, they were attacked by the Amorites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Turnamites, uh, not Turnamites, they were, but they were being attacked by everybody. Brother, everything was going wrong. But now the Bible says there's peace among the neighbors because all of them are afraid of Hezekiah. They're saying, my soul, we're not going to send our army over there. An angel of the Lord might kill them too. So there's peace among the neighbors. There's prosperity. The treasury balance goes up. The balance sheet looks great. Prospects look great. The future was bright. Everything was absolutely phenomenal in the first 14 years. And then Hezekiah went, <coughs> and the Bible says he got sick. And it was a sickness unto death. Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, the Bible says uh, that he got some kind of infection. And back then they didn't have uh, penicillin or, or something to kill those infections. And brother, it was about to go septic over its body. And it was a sickness unto death. So here's my first point. We got a mighty miracle. Don't you love when God does a miracle? Amen. Isaiah, the prophet, shows up at the hospital. And he says, now listen, Hezekiah, you better get your affairs in order. You need to sign your will and get ready to meet Jesus because you're about to die. Brother, I've, never, I've been in the hospital a lot of times. I've never told anybody that. Uh, so God laid that on his heart. He said, listen, you need to tell Hezekiah he's about to die. So like most of us, when the preacher leaves, Hezekiah basically begins to weep and to cry out before God and say, God, please heal me. Oh, God, I don't want to die. I've been a good church member. I've been a good believer. I've done good things. And, oh, God, please, please, please heal me. And here, here's, here's what I want you to think about, okay? This is the first part. Uh, two things to consider when, when you're praying a prayer before God, a really important prayer. First of all, my, my question would be, Why? Why are you asking for what you're asking for? If it's for healing, why? Why do you want to be healed? If it's for your why do you want your parents healed? Why, why do you want that new promotion? Why, why do you want that new wife? Why do you want that new husband? Why do you want that new car? Why are you asking for what you're asking for? Why are you asking God to perform a miracle in your life? It may be to heal your body, it may be to heal your marriage, it may be to heal your finances, but the question is why, and I ask you this, is the motivation for this a selfish reason or possibly for pride? In James chapter 4, verse 2, the Bible says, you lust, you desire, and you have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and you war, yet you have not because you ask not. But... 
verse 3 says, You ask and you receive not because you're asking amiss, that you may consume it upon your own lust. In other words, you're asking selfishly. God's not going to give it to you if it's a selfish motivation. So ask yourself the reason why. I've had young ladies come to my office to pray that God would change their husbands. And my question is why? Is it a selfish prayer? Is it so that it will make life easier on you? Is it to keep you from having to make embarrassing excuses for your husband for why he never comes to church? Why? Why do you want your husband right with God? Or is it for his sake that you desperately want him to know the fellowship of walking with Jesus? Why do you want your husband to get right with the Lord? It's a great question. I had one lady actually come to my office one time and say, Brother Sam, please, let's pray. I want my husband to get right with the Lord. He's been drinking, and, and, and I just want him to get right with the Lord. So we began to pray, and, and he actually got quit drinking, and he got saved. And, and, brother, he got involved. And I'm telling you, he was excited on fire for Jesus, and she turned around and divorced him. And I went, what's the deal? And she said, I knew him and understood him as a drunk. This Jesus business drives me crazy. I, I don't so I think this leads to my second point here. You better be careful what you ask for. When you're praying something, you need to think this thing through and make sure, number one, it's not a selfish reason that you're not doing it for pride's sake, but you're doing it for that person's sake. And the second thing is you better be careful what you ask for. Spoiler alert, this did not turn out well for Hezekiah. Hezekiah said, oh, God, give me more time. Oh, God, I want to live. Oh, God, you got to heal me. Oh, God, I've been good. I've been real good. But I believe he would have done much better if he just went ahead and died. He would have went out at the top of his game as a great hero, made a great prayer warrior, a great man of God. He'd have got on to heaven, gone through the pearly gates, and all would have been well. But instead, it turned out bad for him. Did you know that in the third year of this healing period, he got 15 extra years. In the third year, he had a child by the name of Manasseh. Billy Graham says Manasseh was probably the worst king of all the kings of Judah. Who would have had the throne if Manasseh had not been born and usurped the throne and gotten the kingdom? Wow. Sometimes we beg God for a burden, which we're convinced there's no way it can go wrong, but it was a burden that we were not intended to carry. A great example is the Apostle Paul. He was allowed to see heaven. It's described in 2 Corinthians, and you think, well, my soul, what could go wrong with that? That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? In fact, let me read you the scripture. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4, the Bible says, How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Most theologians across the board all believe that Paul was speaking of himself, and he said, God allowed me to go to heaven. I got to see the 24 elders kneel down and cast their their crowns before the throne of God. I got to see the seraphim and the cherubim. I got to hear them sing. I got to hear things that nobody else has ever heard sing. Verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. In other words, to keep me from being too filled with pride, God knew, God knew by giving me that spiritual experience that I'd get puffed up, I'd get prideful, I'd take all the credit myself, I'd go around going, well, I've been to heaven, you hadn't, ha, ha, ha. He said, because of it, God gave me a thorn in the flesh that three times I asked him, please, God, remove this, and God said, no. I'm not because you get the big head and you'd be worthless to me. See, sometimes we ask, oh, God, why can't I see an angel? You might not be able to handle seeing an angel. God, why don't you do a miracle in my life? Because you'd become so arrogant and snotty, you wouldn't be worth shooting. What you think would be wonderful could very well turn out to be a curse. Let me give you an example. I've heard folks say, God, God, oh, please, God, heal my parents. Heal my parents. But are you prepared for him to heal your parents? Because he's not going to make them any younger. Are you prepared to stand over them 24-hour care? 
Are you prepared to see them suffer and die? Because eventually they will die. Are you prepared for God to answer your prayers? Those are questions you have to ask. I can't answer them for you. But you need to ask yourself those questions. Oh, God, give me a Sunday school class. Boy, if I had a Sunday school class, I'd tear it up. I'd be one. You better be careful. You better be careful what you ask for. Because the Bible says to that person who teaches, there is a greater judgment that God will judge you by. That responsibility. You may be picking up a burden God did not intend for you to pick up. You better be awful careful what you ask for. Oh, God, give me a promotion. I need that promotion. I do great at that promotion. But you may be carrying responsibilities that will make your life miserable. You better be careful what you ask for. Hezekiah said, oh, God, give me 15 more years. And it turned out to be a horrible 15 years. So God will answer Hezekiah's prayers before Isaiah leaves the palace. And, And picture this. You're up in the... Mother Francis Hospital, you're in the Peaches and Owen part, and you visited Hezekiah, you told him you're going to die. You leave, you go down in the elevator, you're about to go through the solid waiting room, and suddenly God goes, you need to go back and tell him he's going to live. So he turns around, gets back on the elevator, goes back up to the fourth floor, and goes back over and starts talking to Hezekiah, and he says, uh, you're going to live. So listen to 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 5, and we're going to look at a meaningful message, Okay. He says, turn again, tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I've heard thy prayer, I've seen thy tears. Behold, behold, pay attention, I will heal thee, and on the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. So what are the messages that we get from this? Well, number one is after receiving a death sentence, you're going to die. He says, you shall be healed and be back among the living in three days. Duh, that's prophetic (laughs) from death to life, three days, Easter. (laughs) And I love how God continues to put prophetic messages for us, don't you? Second, look at the sign. And we've got to think on this one. 2 Kings 20, chapter 9, I mean, verse 9. 2 Kings 29. And Isaiah said, this shall be a sign to you from the Lord that the Lord will do the thing that he has promised. Shall the shadow go forward 10 steps or go back 10 steps? And Hezekiah answered, it is an easy thing for the shadow to lengthen 10 steps. Rather, let the shadow go back 10 steps. And Isaiah the prophet called to the Lord and he brought the shadow back 10 steps by which it had gone down on the steps of Ahaz. Now, Most people, in the King James Version, it says, go back 10 degrees on on the sundial. And that's what we think of. Out in the courtyard, there is a round stone sundial with, that's probably not the best interpretation. Uh, Some of your more modern interpretations will put uh, the steps. Uh, Do y'all have that in in your Bible? Are you looking, did you bring your Bible? Do y'all have a Bible? We we have Bibles for Christmas presents if y'all don't have one. (laughs) The, the best thing is, is steps. And what, what we believe is the best explanation is uh, a modern-day clock back in those days would be a sundial that the Egyptians had. And what it was is out in a courtyard where there's exposure to all the light, you would have a series of steps going up one side, a flat top, and then a series of steps going back down the other side. And on the top of it was a block, and you would align the block with exactly where the sun came up and where the sun was going down. So that would move that portion of it, and what it would do is it would allow it to cast a shadow over the steps. So when the sun came up, and, and it would begin to cast a shadow as it came up on these steps. So the first step, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, then you're flat, then you go back down, 11 o'clock, like that. Do you understand? So it looked like a small pyramid with steps going up flat on the top with a block on top of it. And it's really, really neat. So that as the sun went down, the shadow on the steps went up the backside. So that you're here at the bottom and it's about, let's say, 4 o'clock and then it gets 5 o'clock, one step, and 6 o'clock, the next step, 7 o'clock, the next step, up until it just covered the entire steps. Here's what Hezekiah was asked. He said, do you want the shadow to go up 10 more 
steps or back 10 steps. And he said, it's nothing for the shadow to go up 10 steps because literally a cloud could cover the, 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 the sun and it would cover all the steps. So there's nothing to that. But the real miracle would be take the shadow away. So in other words, as, as, as the shadows went up the steps, and the sun went down, in order for it to reverse the shadow, the sun would have to go back here. It had to reverse. You understand? There are two things that, that it could have happened. Number one, either the earth could have stopped rotation and backed up to where it was 10 degrees or 10 hours backwards on the steps, or the earth could have tilted at that point 20, 26 to 28 degrees, just turn like that. And what's really neat is that's exactly what happened is that either God unrotated and turned it back 10 degrees or he just tilted uh, the earth by 26 to 28 degrees. And you say, well, could God do that? Well, sure he could. The Bible says the earth is his footstool. God, I mean, I mean it's no different than, God, than me tilting that. If God, God can tilt the earth like that, there's nothing to that. I think that's so neat that we serve such a powerful, wonderful God. And that's one of the messages that we've got today is God, our God, is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I could ever ask or think. And I just think that's really, really neat. Amen? So, what has God done? Well, he's brought a great revival in the land. Many people thought it could never happen. The country of Judah had gotten so bad. Do you know there are a lot of people now that think our, our country is too far gone? But it's not. But it's not going to take a Trump to make America great again. And it's not going to take an Obama to make America great again. It's going to take a revival. It's going to take God getting a hold of our churches and squeezing our hearts and for the church to stand up and get on fire for Jesus Christ. And, and see, that's what happened in the heart of Hezekiah. And it began to spread a revival throughout the land. And that's what made Judah great again. After they'd already closed all the church doors, they had idols everywhere. People were sacrificing their babies to Molech. God did a reverse, changed it, and a great revival took place in the land. Everybody was excited. And, and, and a miraculous victory of the enemy. My soul, man, that was in the headlines, 185,000 Assyrians. Man, God gave us about it. Isn't this wonderful? A great, great victory throughout the land. A miracle of healing from death to life. Man, I, it was old. Everybody was talking about it. Hezekiah was dying, and now he's alive. God healed him. This is fantastic. And a great restoration in the eyes of the world. The Bible says Hezekiah began to get gifts from other nations, letters of praise, prestige, honorary doctorates, people wanting him to come speak at their graduation. He got an invitation to speak at the Rotary Club. The Lions Club said, we want you to come be our, our honored speaker today. He was the toast of the town. Everybody was impressed with this young king, Hezekiah. Which leads to our final point, a magnificent mess. Verse 12, 2 Kings 20, 12. And at that time, Merodach Baladin, the son of Baladin, king of Babylon, he sent envoys with letters and a present to Hezekiah. For he heard that Hezekiah had been sick. Hezekiah welcomed them and he showed them all of his treasure house the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious oil and his armory and all that was found in his storehouses. There was nothing in his house or in all of his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet came to Hezekiah and said, uh, what did those men say? And for where'd they come from? And Hezekiah said, they've come from a far country, from the land of Babylon. He said, what have they seen in your house? And Hezekiah answered, he said, they have seen all that is in my house. There's nothing in my storehouse that I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the day are coming when all that is in your house and that all which your fathers have stored up to this day shall be carried to Babylon and nothing shall be left. Thus saith the Lord. So a political delegation shows up from Babylon. They have letters of congratulation. You can hear them reading them. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. The king of Babylon is so impressed with Hezekiah that we have set aside Hezekiah Citizenship Day in Babylon. We flew a flag over the capital on that day. We are now presenting Hezekiah with this flag that flew over the capital of Babylon. We have other gifts for you. 
wonderful fruitcake from Babylon. We have gold and silver and precious jewels. We have necklaces for your wife. We want to give you awards. And I'm telling you what, Hezekiah is flattered. See, here's the thing. Listen to this truth. Sometimes the devil can't get you through foes, the enemy, but he can get you through friends, through flattery. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. The the, the, The world wants to be your friend. We love you. We want to help you. You better beware. There may be a knife coming in your back. Amen. So he gives them the grand tour is what the Bible says. Now afterwards, a preacher shows up. And doesn't a preacher always throw water on the parade? He says, hey, Hezekiah, who are those guys? He said, they were guys from, from Babylon. He said, what would you show them? He said, well, I showed them my bank account. I opened up, I showed them how much money I got in the bank. I showed them my stock portfolio. I showed them my retirement account, how much money we've made through the stock market. I showed them all my precious coins. I showed them my silver and my gold. I showed them my pantry and all the food I've got. All my spices, my olive oils. Then we went back to my bedroom. I showed them my closet. They saw my suits, my shoes, my socks. They saw my wife's dresses and all the stuff. I showed them, I showed them my guns. We, we went and I opened up my gun safe and I said, hey, fellas, come over here and look at my guns. And, and we talked about bullets and, and we talked about guns and pistols and rifles. And, and I even pulled out an AR-15. We went out in the backyard. Ta, 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 ta. Man, they were impressed. They'd never seen a gun safe like my gun safe. And they oohed and awed over my cars and, and my tractors and, and all my nice stuff that I've got out in the barn. And they said, man, we never, and, and, and Isaiah said, uh, do you tell them about Jesus? Did, did you show them the house of God? Did you take these fellows from Babylon over and say, listen, oh, no, don't, don't worry about that stuff. That's just... That, that, that's just trinkets. Let me show you the real strength of Judah. It's right here where you have the altar of burnt sacrifice. See, this represents the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And this is where our salvation's at. Let's go in here, and I want to show you the altar of incense. And this stands for the prayers of God's people and how it's a sweet-smelling savor before God. And you see, when I laid that letter on the altar, that's when God heard my prayers and he gave us deliverance. You see, when I prayed and put my face to the wall, that's when God gave me healing. So all glory and all honor go toward God. But that's not what Hezekiah did. You see, what he did was he robbed God. God of all that glory. He stole God's glory. And he talked all about his stuff. And and, and you can read in the text, he goes, it's my gold. It's my silver. I showed him my house. I showed him my armory. I showed him my closet. I showed him my stuff. And he missed a huge opportunity to glorify Almighty God. And he hogged it all for himself. Woo! Then Isaiah said, all that stuff you showed them, one day the Babylonians are going to come and they're going to take everything you showed them, all the wealth of your fathers, all the wealth of your home, and they're going to take it back to Babylon because they were really impressed and they want it for themselves. And he said, you missed a great, great opportunity to give God glory and you messed it up. In fact, in 2 Chronicles 32, 35, the Bible says that after Hezekiah got got healed, 2 Chronicles 32, 25, listen to this. But Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done to him. In other words, he missed a huge opportunity to give God the glory. I love being the pastor of Flint Baptist Church. I, I, I believe that, that God saved me and called me in the ministry. And, and I, I think one of the wisest things Karen and I ever did in our life was to accept the call to come and to pastor at Flint Baptist Church. And we've had a marvelous, marvelous 24 years. And, and it's been so much fun. But you know, as well as the church is doing, I am not allowed by God to go out and tell people how good we're doing. unless I'm specifically asked, especially around other preachers. 
and I want to so bad. I want them to say, how's your church doing? And I go, oh, it's doing wonderful. It's great. But I can't. Because God has told me, he said, go ahead and brag about it, and, and I'll stop it. I'll stop it. I'll stop the new members coming. I'll stop the baptismal waters being stirred. I'll stop the people coming to the altar. I'll stop moving in your midst if you start taking glory for it. Don't do it. Don't you do it. So people have to specifically ask me how the church is doing. So ask me, how's the church doing? doing? It's wonderful. It's phenomenal. We're seeing people saved. We spent over $500,000 on missions last year because God's opening doors for us on continents we never thought possible. We're seeing marriages saved. We're seeing people give and rededicate their lives. We're seeing Sunday school classes explode. My staff is explode. It is phenomenal. Thank you for asking. I don't know if you ever would. There's nothing wrong with giving glory to God, but I'm telling you something. You better do it in the right way, dear sir. And not start bragging about it on yourself. I believe in 2020, we're going to be given a lot of opportunities. Opportunities to either take credit for the good things in life and to brag on yourself. Or you can defer that praise and say, oh, no, no, no. All glory goes to God. Every good and perfect gift I have is from God Almighty. And I will not rob him of that praise. And in fact, I want to intentionally honor God instead of myself. And I don't want to miss those opportunities. Because God's going to give them to you. And you've got a fork in the road. You can either say, yeah, I just love my car. It's just wonderful. It's great. Or you go, do you know how good God is? And you can share and open the door to telling somebody how good. Because understand something. The reason he created us was to fellowship with him and to give him honor and glory. But if you take it for yourself, then you become a God robber. And you rob God of his glory. So in 2020, what will you do? Will you be the Hezekiah that says, oh, let me show you all my stuff? Or will you say, oh, let me show you my Jesus? Because without him, I'd have nothing. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Billy's going to come and lead us in hymn of invitation. God, we are blessed beyond measure. God, you have done marvelous things. God, God, you've healed us when we've been sick. God, you have blessed us with great prosperity. All of us, God, have some type of vehicle. We got a home. We got food and refrigerator. God, we have a standard of living that our forefathers knew nothing of. God, you've given us victories over the enemy. God, you've taken us from death to life through our salvation. God, we've got so much to brag on you about, and instead, sometimes, all we have to talk about is a dumb gun or a knife. Or a piece of metal when we should be talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Change our hearts, please. Help us to look at this in a different way. That God, we were created to bring you glory and honor. And may that's exactly what we do in 2020. It's these things I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Guys, this morning what we're going to do is have an invitation. It's an opportunity for you to respond if God's spoken to your heart. Maybe you're here this morning, you say, you know, Brother Sam, the truth is I am a Christian. I have given my heart to Jesus, but you are so right. The prayers I've prayed have sometimes been very selfish prayers with the wrong motivation. And even when God gave me what I asked for, sometimes I did not turn around and give him the credit for it. May 2020 be a better year. You know that's what this big old altar is here for? It's just a great place for Christians to come and recommit their lives to Christ. And what better time to do it right before the new year? Just say, God, listen, I can do better in 2020, and I'm going to do better. Nobody's going to bother you. Nobody's going to get you to fill out little cards. Just a great place to spend a minute or two in prayer. Get up and go right back to your seat. Maybe you're here and say, Brother Sam, we've been looking for a church home. I need to be a part of a church family. We'll have decision counselors right here at the front. All you got to do is come to one of them and say, I want to become a member of Flint Baptist Church. And they'll show you exactly what to do. It's not hard at all. But the most important decision, have you ever given your heart to Christ? Have you ever intentionally asked Christ to be your Lord and your Savior? 
Today should be the day of your salvation. To go into 2020 as a born-again believer, ready to serve God, give Him all the glory. So I'm going to ask you to stand, please. Brother Billy's going to lead us in a hymn of invitation. All over this building, Christians ought to be praying. As we begin to sing, would you come? Would you come as we sing? Thank you again for worshiping with us. As a reminder, we have four regular services each week at Flint Baptist Church that are live streamed. Sunday morning at 9 and 10.30 a.m., Sunday evening at 6 p.m., and Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. You can also check out our full website at flintbc.net for other special events and opportunities of service. So, as you've joined us today for a time of worship, if under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you felt the need to renew a commitment to the Lord, or perhaps for the first time in your life, you've decided to invite Jesus Christ to become your Lord and your Savior, we would love to hear from you. Please feel free to send us an email about this exciting decision to info at flintbaptistchurch.net. God bless you, and thank you so much for worshiping with us today.